If you've been keeping up with my review videos lately, then you're probably aware that I don't have the highest opinion of Fate Collide Liner Prisma Ilya. This is cancer! It's a spin-off series that takes a new direction with the Fate franchise, and while it does have some redeeming qualities, it suffers much more than it benefits. During my individual season reviews, I took an analytical look at each episode, and I stated that there may be something good there that I just wasn't seeing, given how many people unironically enjoy this series, despite the despicable content in seasons 2 and 3 and the OVAs. That said, I still feel that on a critical level, Prisma Ilya is just awful. I've heard several defenses of this series, with people saying things like, It's a parody! You're taking this way too seriously! You can't treat it like the other Fate series! Okay, fine, I will look at this series both ways, both as a standalone and as how it fares as part of the Fate franchise. This is a summary of all of Fate Collide Liner's problems and how we can fix them. Problem 1. Bad Characters The majority of the characters in this series are either definitively bad people or are just plain annoying. This includes about half the main cast and a little more than half of the supporting cast. Let's look at them one by one. Elia, our main character. Honestly, if we take her just how she is in the main series and not in the OVAs, she's actually not that bad minus the Shiro abuse, but that's a whole separate bullet point. She's likable enough, and sure she is a little annoying, but that's mostly just because she doesn't question Ruby shenanigans enough and just goes along with way too much of the nonsense. But if we do include the OVA, then she's willing to let Kuro, her sister, cousin, clone thing, she's willing to let Kuro run out of mana if Kuro doesn't model clothes for her. Whether or not it's a hollow bluff, Kuro can't afford to take that risk. If Kuro runs out of mana, then she would get sick, and then she would eventually die, and the show has made it vehemently clear that Kuro cannot get enough mana from anyone other than Ilya or Miyu. So, joking or not, Ilya is being manipulative and holding this over her head. Now granted, maybe Kuro deserves some discipline after how she forcefully took mana from everybody, including Ilya, but that doesn't mean Ilya is in the right for this. Imagine any other scenario where a character had a life-threatening deficiency. Imagine if Kuro was a diabetic and Ilya was withholding her insulin. That's basically what we have here. But what do we expect when her mother also threatens the lives of others for not doing her clothing-related bidding? That plus all the Shiro abuse... No, uh, I'll save that one for later. Miyu and Sapphire are basically the same person. The voice of reason to be the straight man to all the madness. However, the reason that they aren't horrible people is probably because they're super underdeveloped by comparison. Miyu is basically a blank slate when she first shows up, and neither of them are in the spotlight enough to learn a lot about them. I assume that more will be revealed about Miyu and 3Rai, but I refuse to watch any further than I already have. I will say that it's a little strange how Miyu can't fly because she doesn't believe she can, even though she can transform into a magical girl, shoot laser blasts, and she can see Elia flying right in front of her, but this is the one power that's based on belief? What is this, Peter Pan? Also, the way she blew up at Elia during the assassin attack was understandable, even though I think she jumped the gun just a little bit, given that Elia was poisoned and couldn't defend herself otherwise. This gets reconciled later though, so I can give it a pass. Now moving on to our next bad character, Rin Tosaka. For one moment, let's just forget about the Rin Tosaka from Fate Stay Night. Prelia Rin is just run-of-the-mill annoying and doesn't really have much to her. She has very few redeeming qualities. She isn't a good mentor for getting to tell Elia very important things, like the fact that in order to recover the class cards, she has to fight a heroic spirit to the death. She just immediately drafts Elia because she was bonded to Ruby. No checking to see if she knew how to use her powers, and we never even see Rin with Elia training. What kind of mentor is that? She apparently has more important things to do, like pulling childish pranks on her rival Luvia. Also, she's apparently not very wise, because even while she's working for Luvia, because she doesn't have a jewel to her name, she still tries to fight and bicker with her employer. Everything from juvenile pranks to full-out brawling with the person who is paying for the roof over her head and the gems she needs for her magic. Now, if we do compare her to her Fate Stay Night counterpart, she's even worse. Original Ren doesn't miss a beat when it comes to the mission at hand. She's like the Hermione Granger of anime. She takes every precaution necessary and always makes sure her combat partners are informed about the plan, as shown when they battled against Berserker and Kotamine in Fate Stay Night and Gilgamesh in Unlimited Blade Works, but she is not afraid to jump into the fray herself. The fate of the world is on the line, and you can count on the original Ren Tosaka to preserve humanity. I hereby swear that I shall be all the good in the world, that I shall defeat all evil in the world. And with that line, she severs herself from Fate Collide Liner because it is all the evils of the world. You see this face that Tokiomi Tosaka is making? It's because he saw what they did to his daughter in Prisma Ilya. In short, as an original, she has almost no good qualities about her. As an adaptation, they reduced one of the most beloved characters of this franchise to a run-of-the-mill stereotype of a book-smart but clumsy, foolish, and immature teenager. It's no wonder that Mela Lee didn't voice this incarnation of her. Luvia Edelfelt isn't much better. 
I'm going to be fair on this one and say that I don't know much about her. I've only seen her at the end of the Unlimited Blade Works series where she and Ren had that wrestling match, and I haven't watched the Elmoloid Case Files yet. But all that means is that I can't compare her to the original, so all of my animosity for her comes from the Collide Liner version. Firstly, her grating laugh. Nobody likes that kind of laugh. Whenever a character has a laugh like that in anything, they are subject to ridicule from the fandom. It only exists to piss people off. Secondly, the snobbish rich girl attitude. That's all she has to her. That and her superficial infatuation with Shiro. Again, I'll talk more about Shiro later. There are a few small moments in Season 3 where Luvia tells Miyu that she's like a little sister to her, but we never see that. In Season 1, we see Luvia treating Miyu like a servant, forcing her to wear a maid outfit while she works to pay for her lodgings, with Miyu simultaneously fighting to get back the class cards, and then she proceeds to push Miyu out of a helicopter, trying to force her to fly. It didn't work, by the way. So, where exactly is this sisterly love? Sure, because Miyu has no sense of identity in these early seasons, she takes the name Edelfelt, but given how she's treated, I'd say it's more like the branding of a servant rather than a name given to a family member. Much like Rin, Luvia is a simple culmination of two or three traits and patterns that are so predictable you could practically make a bingo game out of every word out of her mouth whenever she's on screen. If Rin's on screen with her, she's most likely going to call Rin poor or commoner or at least bicker in some way. If Shiro's on screen, she'll ogle over him despite them not having any chemistry whatsoever, and the rest is just her spouting some exposition and that heinous laugh. Just one big, blonde cluster of annoyances. Kuro, oddly, is one of the characters that I have the least amount of problems with in terms of how she acts as a character. My biggest complaint with her is her crushing on Shiro because, again, incest is creepy. Her relying on Mana isn't her fault as a character, it's how she was written, so the fault here lies with the creators. So while what she does is bad, the blame isn't entirely on her. A lot of her flaws can be ironed over with some simple rewriting of her mechanics. Oh, Irisfield, you used to be so lovable. You were the sweetest thing in Fate Zero. So optimistic yet wise, innocent yet not overly naive. You were loved by all, and then they made you into this. The mother who encourages the abuse and teasing of her stepson is willing to objectify him to his crushes, who humiliates her housemaids and encourages her daughters to have incestual crushes on their big brother. Irie's just as bad as the rest of them. The side characters are awful as well. Most of them are one note, and that one note is horrendous. Suzuka has no personality outside being creepy and writing erotic fanfics about people she knows IRL. Nanaki doesn't really have much going for her either, aside from apparently she likes to fight and likes to be overly dramatic. Also, when we put the two of them together, they try to humiliate Ilya, Kuro, and Miyu. They try to force Ilya to wear a skimpy swimsuit and then take pictures, but when Tosco does the same thing, they try to cover her up. This inconsistency, along with them teasing Ilya and Miu for sharing ice cream even though they are doing the exact same thing, as well as them using Ilya's birthday as an excuse to go to the beach and then forgetting about the birthday party even though it was their idea, and then they get angry with Ilya for being grateful that people even came to her birthday party, this all hints that they don't even like Ilya and just have her around to pick on her. Mimi is bland and forgettable. She has no purpose in the story aside from being the good person in Ilya's friend group, but when that wasn't enough, the writers decided to make her into a second Suzuka. Tatsuko is the dumb friend who does dumb things. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's just dumb. She's not that terrible. Now, just to clear up one possible misconception from my previous review. I stated that Suzuka's sister is my second most hated character, just behind Ruby and just barely ahead of this world's version of Sela. This is not because of her, <clears throat> uh, hobbies. It's simply because she's nothing but a tool. She's a plot derailing device. She was only made relevant for this one episode and that one OVA short. All she did in the main series episode was give us a way to get Mimi into Yaoi, thus hijacking the already extremely distracted plot. She only exists as an enabler, and she's only there to serve as justification for Suzuka's perverted nature, and consequentially doing the same thing to Mimi. That's why she's the second worst character in the show. Not because of who she is or what she does, but because of what she is and her purpose for existing. The show would have been a lot better off if Bizet had just shattered her skull. Prelia's version of Sela is absolute scum. She's just plain awful. She has nothing of value to the story, but whenever she and Shiro are on the screen together, you can bet that 9 times out of 10, she's going to hit him with something, including a very large walk- AND LOOK AT THAT BLOOD SPRAY! That's just terrible! Lezrix? She's actually not that bad. She doesn't do much, and she's not malicious at all. Whenever she does do something questionable, it's almost always aimed at Sela, which gets a pass from me, or it's done in an airheaded way, and she just doesn't understand why it could be wrong. She's mostly harmless. And then we have Shiro. The problem here is that he exists only as a plot device or as a punchline. They reduce the original main character to Meg from Family Guy. He's only there to offer Ilya some emotional support every now and again, but otherwise, he's just there to get beat up, mostly by Sela. As a character, he's the most likable person in the whole freaking show. 
He's a good big brother, chaperoning his little sister's birthday party, buying her nice gifts, giving her encouragement when she fails a task, visiting her in the nurse's office when she's hurt. She was still the nice guy he always was. But none of these things have a bearing on the overall plot. Okay, I suppose technically he's the one who took Elia to the beach when he found out about the underground tunnel being built, but that's it. But even though he's almost 100% useless to the actual relevant plot of the first three seasons, he's still 100% more likable than any of the other characters, and that makes it 10 times worse that he is the punching bag. With someone as good as that, that'd be like punching Mr. Rogers every five minutes, or just whenever you don't feel like you have a good enough joke to tell. More than that, apparently everyone is crushing on him. Elia, Kuro, Luvia, Rin, and Nanaki's sister, and they all just ogle over him. But despite him not showing any romantic interest or chemistry with any of them, they are still just trying to get into his pants while at the same time using him as this show's whipping boy. You can't have it both ways. Either make him the least likable so it's funny when he's hit, or stop abusing him. But one minor note, in this episode, why is he chasing after Elia, and why didn't he speak up when everyone's arguing over who gets to date him, or how Issei said he wants to make him live in a temple? I chalk it up to lazy writing because that's probably the second worst episode of the main series. And then we have... you. Ruby. You are, without a doubt, the worst character I've ever seen in anything that I've watched so far. And yes, that means you're even worse than Shinji Mato and Tucker from Full Metal Alchemist. You have no redeeming qualities. You exist only to cause misery. You said it yourself. Terrorizing Ilya is the reason for living. You're out of place in your own story because despite the main characters being magical girls, you are the only one who's going on and on about this being a magical girl anime. Even Sapphire barely talks about it. The other characters mention it a few times in the first season, and most of the time it's only because it's a plot device or it was prompted by you. Luvia starts babbling on about it during the fight with Saber Alter just to spite Rin, but you instigated it. Outside of you just running your trap because you like to hear yourself talk, there's more mention of Magical Girls in the Prisma Codes event and Solomon Chapters of Fake Grand Order than the entire rest of the series! This makes half of your existence either completely pointless or completely displaced. You're extremely perverted, you're a pedophile, you try to force your wielder to fulfill your disgusting, lowly incest fantasies, your fourth wall breaks are annoying as hell, you cause the most likable character constant misery, your comedy is random and nonsensical but not in a good way, and honestly this entire freaky show would be better off if you just never existed! So, now that all of that has been said, how do we fix these bad characters? No, no, let's actually be serious for a moment. For starters, let's fix the side characters. Make the group of friends be more consistent with how they act. If they are Elia's friends, then have them act like friends. Make them less creepy. I don't expect a lot from these side characters since the main story isn't about them, but when you do give them screen time, make it something of substance. Don't make it about something that's completely irrelevant to the plot. Don't make them only exist to be creepy or bad people. If you do have them make creepy jokes, like trying to get Elia into that swimsuit, then just make it a one-off and a shorter joke. Maybe show them looking through the swimsuits and saying, hey, how about this one? And then Elia acts disturbed, but end it there. Tatsuko is fine and Mimi is passable except for that one episode, but Nanaki and Suzuka need a major rewrite. Priscilla, if you must have her be super stern with Shiro because he's technically the outsider because he's not an Einsburn, then have it be something less malicious. No face crushing with walks, no smacking with vacuum cleaners, make it like a wooden spoon or a spatula or just grabbing him by the ear. Tone down the abuse in general. Don't kick his head into the wall when he's just repeating something he heard Elia say and don't beat him up for no good reason. For Irisville, make her act like a caring mother. Don't have her only reason for existing to be torturing Shiro, abusing her daughters, or humiliating her maids. Don't make her creepy and make her sweeter and more loving. For Rin, you don't even have to perfectly replicate the original. If you want to make a good version without relying on the namesake of Rin Tosaka for Fate Stay Night, just clean up some of her more minor flaws. If you have to make her a little slow-witted like they're clearly trying to do, then how about something like this? She recruits Elia to get the class cards, but when she's alone reflecting on her mission like we see in this episode, she realizes, hey wait, this is just a normal kid. She doesn't know anything about us. I should explain the situation a bit more thoroughly. That way she doesn't look like a complete idiot. As for her infatuation with Shiro, how about a reason as to why she loves him? We never saw them interacting with each other before she met Elia, and we barely see them interact afterward. It's just poor writing if we're supposed to want to be invested in any sort of romance here. For Luvia, the same notes as Rin. Make her less dim-witted, make her and Shiro have some actual hint of chemistry, and if she's going to say that Miyu is like a sister, then have her act like it. Show some time with them together bonding. I know there was one short where Miyu gets her first bra, but I couldn't find that one to watch anywhere. But I'm going to assume that one short episode doesn't give us two seasons worth of bonding. On a lesser note, I personally despise that laugh, though it is a common anime trope. For both of them, it's okay to have a rivalry, it's okay to fight, but do it when it makes sense. 
During the middle of a fight with a heroic spirit when you are in the danger zone is not the time to bicker like children. For Shiro, just make everyone stop abusing him and show us some meaningful interactions with those who are supposed to be crushing on him. I will say this. I think August being the one to tease him is funny because it actually makes sense. August is Luffy's butler, and she wants to make sure that Shiro is a suitable future husband for her. So the interactions that they have, while they may be creepy, are not malicious and thus are actually funny. Especially when it comes back during the Bathhouse OVA episode. They don't exchange a single word, but the situation and expression speak for themselves. In addition to that, it's only teasing. It's never physical abuse. Sure, he scrubs Shiro's back and that makes him uncomfortable, but he never hits Shiro with a walk or kicks his head into a wall. He just wants to make sure that his master suitor is squeaky clean and well fed on a high protein diet of August meat. Is my meat not appealing to you, young master? As for Ruby, completely scrap the character. Throw her in the trash and start over. Completely rewrite her. Don't make her perverted, don't make her trying to force Shiro and Ely to get together, and don't waste her time on pointless crap and tone down the fourth wall jokes. But since these writers obviously lack the talent to put effort into making a good main character, here's a very simple solution that will make Ruby 100% better while changing barely anything about her. Just take away her personality. Now hear me out for a second. She was created by Zelrect. She's an artificial life form. She's more machine than living. So why not make her a robot of sorts? Make it to where all of her shenanigans are due to a misunderstanding. Make her like Data from Star Trek. In the movie Star Trek Generations, everyone laughs when Worf falls in the water, but when Data pushes Dr. Crusher in, everyone scolds him for it and he's very confused. Why not do something like that? She tries to get Elia to act like a magical girl because on paper, this is what magical girls do, and during the first interaction, she overheard Elia saying that she wanted to be a magical girl. But it's not because Ruby wanted it, it's because she misunderstood Elia's intent. Same thing for her crushing on Shiro. She could have just heard Elia say, I love my big brother, or something like that, and mistook the sibling love for Amorous love, because she's a machine that can't understand a concept like love. So that would make all of her shenanigans due to her trying to do something good, but she completely misses the point and would actually make it funny, instead of her just being an annoying and awful character who loves to ruin people's lives. Okay, now that we've patched up the characters, let's move on to the series' other two biggest problems. First is pedophilia. Correcting this one should be obvious. Just don't have it in there. Stop! No! Just stop it! The second biggest problem is the writing conjoined with the pacing. Admittedly, writing and pacing are two separate aspects of any given form of media, but in this regard, they are part of the same problem. I've stated numerous times that the actual relevant plot of Collide Liner is actually very good and engaging. Instead of just another Holy Grail War, they break from the typical fate formula and give us something fresh and new. And when they actually stay focused on progressing the story, this show is a lot of fun and it's very entertaining. But that's the problem, when they stay focused on it. I've already rambled on about how much filler is in the show, so I'll try to keep this part brief. Now don't get me wrong, downtime is important in any given work. It doesn't have to be all action all the time. We need to see these characters develop in a safer environment. Let's take a look at the Justice League cartoon. The Christmas episode doesn't really have a lot of bearing on the main plot of the show, and there's barely any action, but we get to see a lot of development in all of the characters who are present. Green Lantern and Hawkgirl's new relationship is given some time to bloom, and we learn some about both of them. Martian and Manhunter spends Christmas with the Kents, and we learn a bit about him as well. And then we learn about how optimistic and somewhat childlike Superman still is, reinforcing the so-called Boy Scout behavior he touts. We used to wrap his presents in lead foil so he couldn't peek. You mean Santa wrapped them. And Flash has to work with a villain to give this orphanage a nice Christmas, showing us that he's not just a show-off, and he ends up giving them a gift that's not exactly what they wanted, but it's something that they needed, and they were happy in the end. Now let's take a look at Fake Alive Liner's filler. Not even counting the OVA because they're just bonus episodes, let's look at just the main series. It's hard to find any actual development during most of the downtime. The most development I recall in Season 1's downtime is right after the battle with Assassin because Elia becomes afraid of her own power and doesn't think that she can handle the responsibility. That was one of the only episodes in Season 1 that was mostly downtime, but it actually gave us some semblance of character development. Even though I don't exactly agree with how Miu snapped at Elia, but I digress. In Tuvai, all the filler is useless after Kuro joins up with Elia and company. Almost everything before that, no matter how dull it was, actually furthered the main plot. Kuro was the subject of focus at the time, and she got a ton of development up until that moment with the Holy Grail Deus Ex Machina. But after that, the downtime all goes downhill. It looks like they attempt to cram in some development when Kuro and Elia are having the bake off, and Elia is trying to act like a big sister, but it does nothing of benefit to the actual story. Of course Shiro ends up picking Elia's cake because it was made with love. We could have predicted that outcome just by knowing that this is Shiro we're talking about. He's a good big brother, so he's going to praise Elia's efforts even if she fails. And what happens after he gives this encouragement? Sella smacks him with a vacuum cleaner. Elia trying to act like a big sister goes nowhere, and the only thing that is shown of relevance is Kuro saying that she can absorb more mana from Elia than anybody else, and while that technically is relevant, it's relevant to one of the show's worst aspects. Literally half of 2 Vi hers is irrelevant. 
10 episodes in this season, and the first five episodes only give us two minutes of plot advancement, and that little bit is where the show is the underground tunnel being constructed. That's it. The rest of it up until episode 6 is completely worthless for the rest of the plot. Five episodes of filler wouldn't be a big deal in a bigger series if the show was like 50 episodes long, like One Piece, Bleach, or Dragon Ball. But when the season is this short, there's no excuse. What makes it worse is that all this filler is clustered together right after one of the best parts of the show, the Battle of Bazet, and them revealing that their mission with the class guards isn't finished yet. Season 1 and 2 Vi have a lot of filler, but the worst culprit by far is 2 Vi hers. While filler is the biggest problem with the show's writing, the rest of the problems are how the show handles comedy and cramming in a lot of stuff that'll get you put on an FBI watch list. There are four primary sources of humor for this show. First is Rin and Luvia fighting. We're supposed to laugh at how much these two are constantly bickering, but it's almost never funny because of when it happens. It's almost always during a dangerous situation, reference the battles with Caster and Saber. Attempted comedy or not, it's at the wrong place and wrong time and it ends up nearly getting them killed. Second, Shiro abuse. They follow the same logic Family Guy follows with Meg. Need some slapstick because we can't tell a good joke? Just hurt this character even though they did absolutely nothing wrong. The only exception I give to this is August, but I already talked about that. Third, Ruby's fourth wall breaks and shenanigans. What makes a fourth wall break funny is when it's cleverly inserted without distracting too much from the action and the story that's going on. Here are some examples of good fourth wall breaks. Don't touch that dial, kids! I'm not supposed to lose. Let me see the script. And the summer just keeps going on and on, and it feels like it's been going on for like four years! Dude, this is television. The good guys always win. Ruby never talks directly to the audience and does acknowledge that she's in the real world. But the problem with her constantly referencing magical girls is that the only magical girls that exist here are the ones that wield her and Sapphire. She obviously takes notes from other magical girl anime, most notably Cutie Honey, given how much she talks about fan service through transformations. And while the logic she follows might work with Elia because we see that Elia actually knows about this stuff, it doesn't work with anybody else. She keeps throwing out references while being wielded by Rin, but to our knowledge, Rin doesn't follow this logic and she's actually focused on the situation at hand. So Ruby doing all this is not only distracting to the audience, but is distracting to the main characters and putting them in danger. They literally pause in the middle of the fight with Saber Alter to argue about what makes a good magical girl and how combat should be carried out. I wasn't joking when I said the Saber just stands there. The whole fight literally comes to a screeching halt and it makes even less sense because they firmly establish that corrupted heroic spirits, minus Gilgamesh, are completely mindless and bent on attacking everything they see. So why would Saber pause to let them argue? She should have taken advantage of this and blasted them while they were holding still. The fourth and worst source of humor they rely on is perverted humor, meaning lots of fan service and creep factor from naked lolis. Ruby also makes reference to this, saying that Elia is supposed to give fan service despite her being 11 years old and underdeveloped. The most important part of any transformation is the naked fan service obscured by convenient beams of light. Ruby herself is a pedophile. Look at what she says when Elia's clothes are falling off. Now that's a pretty picture if I've ever seen one. And when Kuro's being forcibly stripped by Sela in the OVA. <laughs> and her saying that Mio and Kuro should do sexy poses while dressed like cat girls. And they also play the creepy incest crushes for laughs as well, with Ruby trying to force Shiro to fall in love with Elia and Kuro trying to force Shiro to look at her either in skimpy clothes or completely naked. And after I went to the trouble of picking out a super cute bikini just so I could show off for you. Am I sexy? None of this is funny. It's just creepy. Imagine somebody doing this in real life. Is it funny? No, it's just disturbing and that will cause all kinds of problems. And Mama Irie just seems to be okay with the whole thing. And at the end of the day, the only one to get any ramifications is, of course, Shiro. Another note I'd like to make about the writing in Collide Liner is that it's rather inconsistent. It takes less than a day to build Luvia's mansion. Construction suddenly began early this morning. But it takes them half a season to rebuild it. Unless this was just to stick it to Bazette, that makes no sense. But then again, this is Luvia we're talking about, and she loves money. So I wouldn't put it past her to put everything on hold till Bazette paid off that debt. Another inconsistency is one brand of humor that I didn't mention earlier because it only appears in 2-Fight, and that is, stupid for the sake of stupid is funny. Tatsuko ruins the pound cake their class is making not once, but twice, for no given reason other than stupid is funny. Yet during 2 by hers, she seems noticeably smarter and wiser, and we don't see this behavior anywhere else. And apparently everybody thinks that Kuro's Elia, despite them having different hair, eye, and skin color, even if they saw the two of them less than a few minutes apart from each other. Did you get a sunburn, Elia? Your skin doesn't look so dark all of a sudden. Uh -uh. Even if they look that similar, their actions and voices should tell you that they're different people. And when Iru brings Kuro to the family home later, nobody is going to question why she was in the bathroom with him that one time, No, where did she come from, why was she at Luvia's house, etc. But again, this level of unintelligence seems to only be in Tufi. Now don't get me wrong, stupid for the sake of stupid can be funny. Just look at Ed from Ed and Eddie. But one of the reasons that it works there, but not here, is because it's just one character and not the greater portion of the cast. 
Okay, now that we've gotten all that out on the table, how do we fix this? Besides the easily removed pedophilia, the biggest problem here is the filler, and the filler mostly contains just nonsense or supplemented by excessive creepy pedo fanservice moments. So, I propose taking the Mobile Suit Gundam route. The original Gundam series was a little over 40 episodes long, so they took the main series, cut out all the filler, kept the most important plot points, reanimated a few moments to make them look better, rearranged a few things, and gave us a movie trilogy. They also did the same thing for Zeta Gundam several years later. So why not do the same thing here? Keep only what's relevant to the show's plot and make a movie out of each season. That way we get only the good stuff. I'd even be okay with keeping Kuro's dependence on Mana because she's basically a heroic spirit. But instead of having her kiss little girls all the time, have her do something like Shinji and Ryder did in the original Fate Stay Night. Since she apparently already knows about the Einsburns and mages, have her set up a magical sealed trap and absorb Mana through people via magical means or by consuming their blood. This would not only make her a threat for trying to kill Elia, but also a threat to Fuyuki, and capturing her would be all the more urgent and interesting. And then, remove this mechanic during the Holy Grail Deus Ex Machina bit by having her just become a normal human mage. And, because she's an Einsburn, she would still be able to pull off all of her magic abilities like projection. If Shiro can pull it off, even if it's just with some help from Ren, then Kuro, being an Einsburn, could definitely pull it off because of their high magic circuit count. And that way, she wouldn't have to be molesting lolis all the time. Make these few changes, and this has the potential to be one of the best things the Titan Moon has ever produced. I'd say it would even be in the top five. But as it stands now, it's just a clunky and confused mess that tries to be its own thing, a lowly Yuri, a magical girl show, and a Fate series all at once, and the product on the whole suffers because of it, and I can safely say that it is the worst anime that I've watched to date. Now, I'm going to address some common defenses of this show. It's a parody slash comedy series. It's not meant to be taken seriously. Then why does it have some of the best action in all of Type Moon, and why do they act like they want to be invested in the actual plot? If this show was meant to be funny, then why don't they actually give us more than two funny jokes? By the way, those really funny moments came from the OVA shorts that aren't even part of the main series. Just saying it's a parody slash comedy so it doesn't have to be serious doesn't work either, because it's not funny enough to be a comedy, and the action is too well integrated to be just a comedy series, and according to a lot of people who have watched past two by hers, the show starts to get serious in 3 Right, which only hurts the show even more. You can't have the first half be parody, and then the second half be serious all the time in the same storyline unless you have a damn good way to make it all flow well, like Red vs. Blue, but even then, that's heavily debated amongst the fanbase as to whether or not it was done well. But you can do both extremely well. Avatar The Last Airbender does both, Full Metal Panic does both, and even Fate Stay Night does both. If this is supposed to be a parody, this is not a good one. A good parody is Spaceballs or Monty Python. They address the problems and tropes, and make good jokes about them instead of just bringing them up and overusing the tropes like Ruby loves to do. But if you want a better fate parody slash comedy series, then go watch Carnival Phantasm. The next defense I hear, you can't treat it like every other fate series. Why not? This series is just coasting on the popularity of the fate name to draw in its viewers and readers. Be honest, how many of you watching this would have actually watched or read Collide Liner if you didn't know what fate was first? If something's going to try to use a name, then they should at least try to live up to that name. That's why I consider this to be the Teen Titans Go of anime. Again, I'll address Carnival Phantasm. While it's technically not just a Fate series because it incorporates other Titan Moon properties as well, it's still better than this because of how they handle the characters. Despite the ludicrousness of the setting, the characters are still in character, and that's what makes it funny. It's like that OVA where Brazette was a maid. It's so funny because she acts like she's supposed to. She's close to her original personality, and when she's put in this ludicrous situation, her reactions are what's funny about it. In fact, I'm pretty sure they actually stole that bit from Carnival Phantasm. On another note, I keep seeing people say, Best Fate series. So therefore, I can and will treat it like every other Fate series. And while it definitely lives up to the namesake in the combat portions of the show, I've come to expect higher quality writing from Type Moon. It's a lot like the original VM because it has sex and a lot of filler in it. This argument is extremely flimsy. Firstly, except for Heaven's Feel, the sex wasn't a huge plot point during the VN. It technically was relevant, sure, but not so much to the point that they had to keep it in the anime adaptations. In Face Day Night, there were two scenes, and in Blade Works, there was only one. In FSN, the first scene was changed to where it depicted Rin transferring some of Shiro's magic circuits to Saber, and the second scene, there might have been something implied, but either way, it's just glossed over. And in both adaptations of Blade Works, Rin gives Shiro her mana in two different ways either by transferring her remaining command seals to him, or by giving him her family's magic crest. Regardless, the hentai scenes were not the primary focus, nor were they a frequently recurring thing. The visual novel is allowed to have a lot of filler because it's a game. Each choice you make has an influence on the outcome of the game, and a good chunk of the choices happen during the downtime, so that means that the downtime isn't filler and it actually has a bearing on the ending. Second, just having one or two things from the original automatically makes it good, 
The Phantom Menace has a big space station battle similar to the Death Star, and not one, but two lightsaber duels. Does everybody love it now? What about The Force Awakens? It's almost a no-for-no -no retelling of the original Star Wars. Does everybody love this now? Third, in further regards to the sexual content and fan service, the VN made it blatantly clear that everybody is at least 18. It says it right there. Even Ely is 18 in the original, but guess what? She didn't get a sex scene. You know why? Because lowly fan service is creepy. The last biggest one I hear. Leave Ilya alone! Are... Are you kidding me right now? This is what you're going to have as Ilya's defining work? This is what you're going to rally around when you hear the name Ilya? Never mind how big of a role she played in the rest of the Fate universe where she was more interesting and complex. No, we want to defend the one that gives us lowly fan service. And that's what this all boils down to. Given how bad the first three seasons of this show are, the only reason I can come up with as to why I keep seeing so many people unironically saying Best Fate series is because it's coasting on fan service, and that is the laziest way to gain viewers and readers. It's the clickbait of anime and movies. Now what is the one thing, if you put it in a movie, it'll be successful? Tits. Or in the case of Collide Liner, the lack of tits. The bottom line, even without seeing the fourth season in the movie, Fate Collide Liner on the whole is a bad product, and it's going to take a lot to convince me otherwise. I said it before, and I'll say it again. I believe that this is just a bad fanfiction that somehow got greenlit to become an actual fate property. Here's my evidence. Let's take another look at My Immortal, that Harry Potter fanfiction. The similarities here are astounding! Firstly, having pre-existing characters acting nothing like their original selves. Also, having some of the characters that were introduced in this work be Mary Sue's with very few character flaws and having everybody like them. Secondly, underage sexual content. The author of My Immortal states that the main character is 17. Still a minor. And Collide Liner? Lowly's. And in the OVAs, Kuro's humping Ilya. So not only is this anime Fate plus My Immortal plus Kiss X Sis, but now we can add Boku no Pico to the mix as well. Kill me now! Third, lazy naming scheme. Many of the Harry Potter characters that appear in My Immortal were renamed using edgy sounding names. One of the characters is flat out named Darkness. Kuro means dark, so we'll just call you Kuro. You named evil Ilya Dark? Also, technically, Kuro means black. While we're at it, Kuro's just a palette swap of Ilya. So this isn't just taking notes from a bad Harry Potter fanfic, but now it's taking notes from the Sonic fandom. Fourth, sexual content related to the teachers. Snape was depicted as a rapist and a pedophile in My Immortal, and Kuro made out with Taiga, and there's pedo fan service all over the place. Fifth, breaking the rules of the established canon. This one speaks for itself. In My Immortal, several wizards and witches use a lot of muggle technology that absolutely would not be allowed in canon, and magic users who do so in-universe are shunned by the wizard world. And, well, Collide Liner's Collide Liner. Which brings us to... Sixth, lazy explanations for the broken canon and plot holes. Here's a screenshot from the manga, where the author tells us not to question the changes. In My Immortal, one of the characters is singing a song that wasn't released at the time the story takes place, and this is made even worse by the author drawing attention to it, telling the audience to pretend that it was written back then. Seventh, arbitrarily making a character a different age. The author describes Wormtail, who is incorrectly named Snaketail, as being 16. She draws great attention to this, saying he is 16, so he's not a pedophile in this version, and Elia is made to be 11 rather than being 18 like in the original. Eighth, the Mercedes-Benz. Draco Malfoy drives a flying Mercedes-Benz, and according to Ruby and Prisma Codes, Irie drives a Mercedes-Benz despite them dragging out the R syllables to disguise the car's name, and I really should not be able to draw this many similarities between Fate and my Immortal. With all this and more, anybody would be hard-pressed to convince me that this didn't just start as some awful fanfiction. But hey, maybe it was meant to parody fanfics. But if that's the case, then why would you parody the worst fanfiction ever? I'm just saying that if Adventure Time and Gumball can parody these kind of tropes better than you, you might want to reconsider your work. And according to a lot of people, that's what they did with Oath Under Snow, but I'm still skeptical. I don't make major motion pictures, I make crap. Even if they are telling the truth and it does get better, we shouldn't have to sit through three seasons of crap before we get to the good stuff. In my eyes, this series blew its chance with me after episode 3 of 2 by Hers, where, only three episodes prior, we had a major plot development and one of the best fights in all of Fate. And what do they do with all this build-up? They waste our time with half a season of nothing of substance and give us half creep-out content and half just irrelevant nonsense before slowly continuing the story and giving us a lackluster climax for the third season. So you have to pardon me if I'm a little slow with trusting this series with giving us anything good from this point onward. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to see my individual reviews of the first three seasons of Fake Collide Liner and the accompanying OVAs, feel free to click the links on the screen or check the description below.